In the mid-70s, fear would strike a once carefree college town. This is something that happens on television. This is something that happens somewhere else. That was terrifying. Thor Christensen was plucking young women from the streets for his sick satisfaction. Cold-blooded, heartless, absolutely no conscience. But how did Christensen come to commit these heinous crimes? Thor was just not a very nice person. He'd be fine, and then all of a sudden he'd snap. And was he born to kill? His eyes got focused, and he was telling me they deserved it. Isla Vista is a very unique place on Earth because it's an enclave surrounded by wetlands and it is the, the student housing for that university, UC Santa Barbara. So there's really, you don't have people from other walks of life who live there. Isla Vista and the UCSB campus are about 15 miles from downtown Santa Barbara. So in that way, they're really isolated and really their own little community. You're looking at just a bunch of kids that are going to or from classes or to and from study. In the evening, it's like a bunch of ants that have been turned loose looking for sugar. In the mid-1970s, Isla Vista was an idyllic, hopeful place. It was a, a community time. People, uh, we, we started a credit union whose uh, slogan was, you know, join the credit union and lend money to your friends, you know. It was uh, also a very active time creatively. People wanted to meet in the park and juggle. A lot of music, a lot of uh, uh, theater stuff going on. There was a lot of optimism. Part and parcel of that youthful positivity was the practice of hitchhiking. Hitchhiking wasn't this horrible, evil thing that a few people did. A lot of people hitched because that was the only way they could get around. Students didn't have cars. Hitchhiking was pretty common practice at the time, even though we were always told it was dangerous, especially for uh, young women to, to be hitchhiking. But in November 1976, the dangers of hitchhiking were suddenly and frighteningly brought home. Our office was advised of a missing person, college co-ed Jacqueline Rook, and uh, you get a lot of missing persons, you know, from the Isla Vista community, and, and within a day, you know, they're, they're back. And in this case, she never came back. And so that placed everybody on alert because we discovered not only was she missing, but she was last seen hitchhiking. 21-year-old student Jacqueline Rook had been sighted at a busy junction on the outskirts of Isla Vista. She'd told a friend she was going shopping. That caused us a great deal of concern because she was missing longer than 24 hours. Her disappearance sent shockwaves through the student community. There was, a, I think, sort of a collective gasp. And speaking from my own experience, you know, I'm 22 years old. This is something that happens on television. This is something that happens somewhere else. It doesn't happen in little Isla Vista. It doesn't happen at UCSB. It was clear the 21-year-old must have been abducted. But where she was now was a mystery. The community believed an oddball or lunatic must have struck. The myths and the misconceptions are that it's this crazy sex starved maniac who's going to jump out of the bushes and, you know, stranger danger sort of stuff. And, and I think that was the paranoia that was going on at the time. 
It's this, you know, this crazy guy in our midst. Watching the events with interest was a young local. Thor Christensen had grown up in a unique town not 40 miles away from the campus. Solvang started in 1911 by a bunch of Danish immigrants that uh, purchased this land and started a Danish community. And they started a Danish cultural center for uh, speaking the Danish language, uh, dancing, and other things. And then, slowly but surely, the town popped up. Born to Danish immigrant parents, Thor had grown up at the family's Solvang restaurant. His parents had very, very nice restaurant. You know, his parents very nice, Thor was very nice. We always, you know, played together. But then as we started getting into like sixth, seventh grade, well, he was finding small animals at first, and he'd just step on them and kill them. And then I think we were in maybe sixth, seventh grade. We had a butterfly net, but he'd catch sparrows and bullfrogs. And I'm not sure where he got the firecrackers, but he would tape them to these animals, and then he'd let the birds go, and they would explode and kill the bird. Same with the for bullfrogs. But as Thor Christensen grew older, killing animals would no longer be satisfying enough. In the mid-1970s, the student community of Isla Vista, near Santa Barbara, had seemed a perfect idyll. But then a young woman, Jacqueline Rook, had mysteriously disappeared. And she would not be the last. Two weeks later, in December 76, 19-year-old waitress Mary Ann Saris vanished from plain sight. She had a habit of hitchhiking, so the, the assumption is she was hitchhiking when she was picked up. This next intersection will be Patterson. Mary had disappeared from a busy junction near the hospital. Here's Galita Valley Cottage Hospital, they call it now. Then, a popular place from which to catch a ride. That is the intersection, and that's, this is what it, I mean, it's the buildings have changed, and, and the configuration of the hospital has changed, but it's still the same busy intersection that it always has been. At around 4.30 p.m., Mary had attended an appointment at the hospital. Highly probable uh, she left the hospital and came out to this intersection and caught a ride. In the space of just over a fortnight, two young women had vanished from the Isla Vista area. When Jackie disappeared, that was one, and it, in some ways it was almost easy to dismiss that. It's a one-time thing. Um, when Mary disappeared, now this was something, and, and, and then the fear level was definitely up. It wasn't some bad part of town, it was, uh, it was in our own community. We were also scared because it was this stranger danger thing. You know, who was this guy? Nobody had any clue. Um, we had no idea, and there was a feeling like we're being targeted or it's here. It's not just somebody passing through. People were really scared, and they thought it was somebody perhaps in their midst. Despite a huge police operation, investigators were baffled by the disappearances. Not only was patrol operations involved, our criminal investigations, our detectives were involved in that. In those days, our detective bureau was three times the size we are now, and they had quite an extensive team trying to follow up leads and things of that nature, trying to determine who this, this uh, perpetrator was. Nobody saw anything. There was really no, no leads that we can speak of. Detectives searched for suspects in Isla Vista and the surrounding area, but one man avoided their attention. Thor Christensen had grown up in the nearby Danish community of Solvang. 
From an early age, others had noticed a dark side to Thor's personality. My mother never liked Thor Christensen. My mother always said, I don't like that. Look at that kid, I don't like him, Ronnie. As we got into seventh grade, every morning at recess, after we'd finished playing basketball, Thor would kick my basketball across the yard. And I'd have to go get it, and I'd be late to class. Thor was just not a very nice person. He'd be fine, and then all of a sudden he'd snap. And he'd just be mean and nasty. And I don't know why. His dad wasn't real nice to him. His dad was a hardcore alcoholic. And uh, he was a pretty mean guy. And he beat up on Thor. When a parent is an alcoholic, often they're very unpredictable. You never know when they're going to treat you harshly or even, even hit you from out of nowhere. So children of alcoholics often have issues with controlling their world and controlling others. By his early teens, Christensen was showing signs of an addictive nature. Let's see, in seventh grade, um, what are you, 12? It was the first time I ever had a, a beer, because I was hanging out with Thor, and he got us a beer. And that was my first beer. Didn't like it at all. But I think Thor started drinking at a very, very early age. Unfortunately, the tendency to become alcoholic is somewhat hereditary, 15 to 20 percent. So some of that tendency to, to, to get into the alcohol would be related. He was a very good student and extremely bright. But somewhere along the way, um, in junior high school or so, his grades started to plummet and he got involved with drugs or whatever. Gained a tremendous amount of weight. He went up to 275 pounds at one point. Entering high school, the overweight Thor struggled with the opposite sex. Basically, back then, you know, me and all the guys were at that age, you know, we're all chasing skirts. And so being in his physical shape, it's kind of hard for him to get girls. Um, so he, I know that bothered him a lot. To onlookers, the young Thor lacked the drive and motivation of his successful restaurant-owning parents. He was fairly spoiled, you know, he had an Audi, you know, who has an Audi at, at you know, 16? And I think part of that was because his parents worked very hard to uh, run their restaurants. So he was kind of like, you know, they dropped some money on his dresser and he was off doing his own thing. His mom would always bring him $20 first thing we'd do is go get a fifth of scotch and he'd get a pack of cools and have it, and he'd have a couple of shots before class so he started out his day with a few cocktails before we'd even go to class years later in Isla Vista the disappearance of Jacqueline Rook and Mary Saris would spur the frightened young community into action a lot of people hitched because that was the only way they could get around. So now this was really an issue. People were really scared. So posters started going up, flyers started going up. There were protests um, downtown at the bus station. There was a feeling like we, we have to do something. One of the students campaigning for awareness of the dangers was a 21-year-old actress and juggler, Patricia Laney. Patty was a really smart, bright person. And when I say a bright person, uh, she could brighten up a room by walking into it. And she could brighten up a meeting or brighten up a rehearsal. Uh, she smiled a lot. She was very active in a lot of different uh, community organizations, whether it was the, uh, the credit union that we formed or the, the food cooperative uh, or the medical clinic. Uh, a lot of people knew her. She was very active in, in the community. We were close and uh, we decided to do a, a show together. There were, I think, six of us at the time. And the show we were going to do, we took the story of Peter Pan and there was this uh, Wendy character. And since there were five guys and, and Patty, it would seem, you know, that's probably what drew us to the show. 
So we were rehearsing probably twice a week. But Patty Laney would not make that performance. On the 18th of January, she vanished into thin air. She had been distributing flyers because there were two women who uh, were missing, and Patty was uh, putting up flyers on, uh, you know, in another part of town. One of the members of the theater group was supposed to pick her up, and he was late, and just uh, never, we just never knew what happened. Patty had vanished from the corner of Hollister and Patterson the same place that Mary Saris had last been seen some six weeks before. It's incredible that uh, two girls end up missing from the same basic intersection on different days. Wow. Within 24 hours, Patty Laney's fate would be revealed, marking a twisted new chapter in the once peaceful community. It was on Rafufia Road, just below Rancho del Cielo, President Reagan's property on, on Rafufia Road. Uh, one of our newer deputies at the time, he was patrolling one day, stopped his vehicle on one of the turnouts and looked over the side and, and lo and behold, there was a fresh dumped body. Her body was stripped, the uh, clothing, her backpack and other effects was found about eight tenths of a mile from where she was found. You know, it's weird when, you know, when you have a, a friend and um, we're there rehearsing twice a week and then all of a sudden they're just not there anymore. They're gone. Uh -huh. Patricia Laney had been shot in the side of the head and discarded near the road. But as distressing as the discovery of her body was, it provided detectives with their first clues as to the identity of her abductor. It's a rather remote road, and, and someone who didn't know this road may not pick this road to drive on. It had indications that someone was familiar with this road and where it would take them. As well as the suggestion that the perpetrator had local knowledge, investigators discovered another clue nearby. We found white paper towels similar to what you would find in a restaurant uh, near the body and they subsequently processed those white paper towels and they, they got some latent prints in the victim's blood and the suspect's fingerprints and that told us made us believe that probably what happened was is that he he pulled the gun out he shot her kicked her out the, the, the car door, but she bled inside his car and he used these towels to clean up the mess and then threw everything out. Not knowing that he left his latent fingerprints and her blood on these paper towels. The Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department mounted a huge operation in an effort to identify a suspect that could be checked against the fingerprints. How tall do you think he was? Remember what he was wearing? Do you know which way he walked? Remember, fingerprints do you no good if you don't have something to compare them to. This person had never been arrested, so there were no fingerprints on file. And so we had evidence that would say who did it, but we didn't have a way to find out who they belonged to. While detectives searched for a suspect, the community was left in fearful limbo. Patty was one of the people who was very active when the other two women had disappeared. Patty was the one who started making flyers and getting the word out and looking at protests and demonstrations, and she became a victim. So that 
I think that added another layer of fear for all of us. If it can happen to Patty, somebody who's aware, then truly it can be any of us. So that was terrifying. We were very frustrated because, because we couldn't come up with information that, that, that told us who to go look for. The usual picture is a 28-ish, you know, under 30, white guy. Why they're white, I can't, I don't have the answer to that. And usually of a borderline personality, schizoid, paranoid, narcissistic, trouble relating to others. We used the FBI, and the FBI said, you know, uh, uh, when you're profiling, yeah, you're looking for a younger person that's a loner. Well, there's a lot of younger persons that are loners that attend that university and live in this area. One such loner was Thor Christensen, the 19-year-old who'd grown up in the nearby Danish community of Solvang. At first, he was a type of person that would just like join large groups and we would be partying all together, going to cake parties and enjoying life, going down to the beach. And more and more, as uh, the years went by, he seemed to be more recluse. He would make some statements to me, even at that age, that were pretty ruthless. And I'd look over at him while we were driving and was going, you know, Thor, man, your scruples are few in number. I actually nicknamed him Cloudy and Overcast Christensen. He was kind of mad at the world. His friends would only find out later just how mad he was. In the mid-70s, three young women had mysteriously vanished from the college town of Isla Vista, California. In January 1977, the body of Patricia Laney had been found dumped in a canyon. And as investigators searched nearby, they found another. 21-year-old Jacqueline Rook had been the first to disappear. After two months of searching, her fate was finally revealed. We found Rook in the same road, in a different location, but up the same canyon. Uh... A similar M.O., shot in the head, body dumped, not far from where the other one was found. Jacqueline had been shot twice through the skull. Some of her clothes had been removed after her death. I had to make a commitment to the mothers that if we discovered or got answers, that I would personally call them, and I did. And that's very difficult and very painful for me because I had to tell the mother that her daughter was dead. You realize what somebody has just lost. The way both young women were found provided detectives with clues as to how their killer may have been operating. Then it starts to come together what happened, both of them. It wasn't a major effort to conceal the body a long ways off the road. That tells you that he shot them and pushed them out of the car and then drove away. And it was clear that the road from which the bodies were dumped was also significant. When you find two bodies of missing girls in the same general area, then you say, why did the person go this way? Was it somebody from, from the Isla Vista community who picked up the hitchhiking girls and just took them there? Or was it somebody that picked them up and on his way home killed them and dropped them there? It creates a lot of questions that, that don't have answers. The road was a back route, sometimes used by residents of the town of Solvang. Less than a month after the discovery of the two bodies, local teenager Thor Christensen had taken his friend out for a drive. Thor and I stopped at a liquor store in Goleta. Back then, you could just pull right off the highway and go right down to the cliffs, overlook the ocean. It was in a park after hours, and it was a, no a park notoriously known for kids making out and smoking dope and things like that. Cracked a couple beers, and I was rolling up a joint. And what Thor didn't realize is he had his foot resting on the brake. <laughs> so a sheriff went by. 
and spotted spotted the brake lights. They cruised down. So as they approached the car, they saw bottles on the ground and realized that these kids were drinking. And he says, all right, uh, hand me the beer. I handed it to him. And he says, all right, man, we're just going to write your ticket. And uh, Officer Shaw says, well, I'd like to check the trunk. Thor didn't want him to check the trunk. He did not want to open that trunk. And I just said, Thor, just give him the keys and let's get out of here. They got the beer, they got our weed, let's go. And finally, he just took the keys from Thor and opened up the trunk. And a paper bag was found that was thought to have perhaps marijuana until they picked up the bag and it was very, very heavy. And there was this 22 pistol. Despite the recent abductions and murders, Christensen's possession of a gun was not considered unusual. At the time, in rural California, such weapons were relatively commonplace. I, I don't think that that would have uh, alerted anybody to, to a problem, especially in the, in the, in the mid-70s. Because, you know, it's, it's rural and there's mountains and, and, and a lot of people go to the mountains and, and, and target practice. It's just a normal thing for a kid like that to go out and fire his, his weapon in the mountains. The gun was confiscated, but Thor Christensen was not arrested or considered a suspect in the case of the missing and murdered young women. I said, Thor, what are you doing with a pistol? And he says, well, I thought, well, maybe we'd go down to the river and shoot some rabbits. But what struck me at the time was Thor was the kind of guy that really wouldn't even want to step off the sidewalk. He was going to get his feet dirty. He wasn't, you know, like, you know, he wasn't uh, like me, a dirt bike guy or a fisherman. So it kind of didn't jive, but I didn't really think too much of it at the time. After the encounter with the police, the abductions in Isla Vista stopped. Thor Christensen left town. When he returned several months later, friends noticed he'd slimmed down and had begun making regular trips to Los Angeles. He headed off to Oregon and came back, and he was thin, and he had fixed his dead eye. All of a sudden, he took these trips to L.A., he was out of town, and then he'd come back, and he was just super anal about keeping his car clean. And that's something I didn't really see before in him. I noticed how concerned he was about cleaning the trunk all the time. And I'd even say, Thor, why are you so worried about the trunk? You know? Ever since the publicity surrounding the hitchhiker murders, the killer had stopped striking in Isla Vista. If they're looking for someone who's going to pick up a hitchhiker, he's going to switch his M.O. and go to another type of easy abduction. And where's the place you go if you want a girl to jump into a stranger's car? Sunset Boulevard, Hollywood. Two years after the last known Isla Vista murder, a prostitute working the streets of Hollywood would provide the solution to the mystery that had both frustrated detectives and terrified students in equal measure. She just happened to be walking on Hollywood Boulevard when he, he wanted to have a date, which is street language for uh, sex for money. When he first picked her up, what does a John have to do? You gotta negotiate a price. So they settled on, this shows you a little bit of time ago, 45 bucks. She accepted and got in the car. Then she said, oh, there's a hotel over here on Franklin, I don't remember, somewhere in Hollywood, go there. We got the room for an hour, blah, 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 whatever. He, kept, he bypassed that, and then she said, well, why are you doing that? Well, go to this one. And he didn't go to that one. He said, didn't want to do that. And by the way, he's making small talk with her, which is kind of interesting. I'm down here from Santa Barbara on vacation. I'm a construction worker in Santa Barbara. And I'm just driving around. And then he started driving up into the Hollywood Hills, which could be pretty solitary and scary, you know? And that's when he pulls the gun out and shoots her. He shot her in the head. She grabbed the wheel of the car. The wheel spun out of control, it crashed. She was able to get out of the car. Then she was able to make it to the doorstep of a neighbor and uh, an ambulance came in and she survived it. But that would not be the end of the story. She was deaf in the ear. She had some scars and the bone shattered, but no brain damage. About three months later, uh, this girl 
had not died and she was back on Hollywood Boulevard in a different bar and in walks the guy who had shot her in the head. She runs into the back of the bar and she goes to a pay phone and I remember asking her, did they keep you on hold? She said, yeah, they had me on hold when he was coming in the bar. She told the police that um, she had been shot in the head uh, a few months before that, and this was the fellow that perpetrated the crime. Detectives quickly noted the similar methods of operation to the murders in Isla Vista and determined the same suspect was responsible for the crimes in both areas. He was a, a young man who lived and grew up in the San Ynez Valley. The perpetrator was determined to be Thor Christensen. When he got arrested, I was like, really, come on. The Isle of Vista murders? The Hitchhiker murders? Thor? He lives up here. We were all in disbelief. You know, none of us really believed it. I didn't believe it at first. You know, I was like, no, nah, this can't be true. You know, it's Thor. He's a little strange, you know, cleans his car too much. But he, you know, who would think that he would go to that extreme? Wow, you know, I can't believe it, you know. But then we all started thinking about it, and it was just like too many things. You know, all of a sudden things started adding up. Investigators also discovered that Christensen had been killing in Los Angeles. By a reservoir high in the mountains above the city, the body of prostitute Laura Benjamin had been discovered. She'd lain there for over a month. Unfortunately, there's a lot of canyons and barrancas and all sorts of valleys around here where bodies can be for a long time before they're discovered. He was on Hollywood Boulevard and, and talking to hookers and they went on a mountain road. He pulled a gun out, put it in her head, and, and shot her. Benjamin had been shot, and in the opinion of detectives, sexually assaulted. I remember one time he came over and he was telling us how he would pay for hookers down in LA. And the way he described it was uh, like it was the best, you know, sex he's ever had. And he was just getting so into it. And I was wondering if he was talking about his victims. You know, I wasn't sure because it, it was very strange and the way he was acting was very strange. Mike Kirkman, who had led the investigation into the three murdered Isla Vista women, had since left the sheriff's department and was employed by the defense. I got a call from my answering service that Thor Christensen at the jail uh, wanted to talk to me. I drove to the jail and went to the interview room, and, and there was Thor. I had already talked to him one or two times uh, prior to this. And that's when this person became a different person. His eyes got focused. His, 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 the muscles in his face changed. And he was telling me that I had to help him from the cops because the girls deserved it. Christensen explained that the girls made fun of him because of his weight. And he went down and confessed each of the three murders. I knew that he had told me the truth, and I knew that the person who told me the truth was not the person that I'd talked to before. Kirkman had heard of cases where people had dual personalities, but never encountered one himself. Thor Christensen was two people inside the same body. I just had the feeling that, you know, wow, uh, this guy thinks what he did was all right. When you understand that, that, that I was involved in this investigation of these three girls who were, who were missing, I was the person who interacted with the mothers of these three girls. And then to have this person in front of me and, and, and telling me that he was justified in what he did, yeah, that, that is pretty, uh, pretty hard to handle. Christensen's confession may have been shocking, but as his trials began, 
an even more sickening element to his twisted crimes would be revealed. Thor Christensen had been arrested and charged with the murders of three young women in the Californian student town of Isla Vista and the murder and attempted murder of two prostitutes in Los Angeles. With his fingerprints and confiscated gun tying him to the crimes, he pled not guilty by reason of insanity. Dr. John Stolberg was employed by the court to assess Christensen's state of mind at the time of the crimes. I was in a five by eight room with a man charged with multiple violent murders two feet from me. And the first thing I noticed was a sharp pencil on the table. And I made sure I quietly got it and put it away for protection, although he didn't necessarily attack men. Christensen would not admit his crimes, but through his interview and study of the facts, Dr. Stolberg was able to form a picture of the accused. He was very heavy, he had a lot of problems in school, and I think throughout the years he was rejected by more and more women and he developed more and more anger. And then that's coupled with relationship problems, impulse control problems, can't get along with people, abused substances. Thor was also revealed to be sexually insatiable. At the time of the LA murders, Thor Christensen had been living with a steady girlfriend. She disclosed details of his appetite. This young man, he was about 21 at the time, had sex three to five times a day, which would make the average man say, what is this guy eating for breakfast? But actually with him, it was a sign of not being well. After being examined by several doctors, Christensen changed his plea to guilty. It would mean he would be required to reveal the details of his crimes in court. For many onlookers, it would be the first time the full horror of his actions would be revealed. He basically said, look, I'm insane, but I can't prove it, and therefore I plead guilty. So the judge then spent an inordinate amount of time exploring that about the commission of the crimes in which he explained in great detail. He answered the judge's questions about what he did, and he explained he, he had very good recall of each of the crimes he committed and how he committed them. In each case, he shot them in the head. In each case, he had sex with them post-mortem. And... Um, in each case, he dumped the bodies. Not only had Christensen callously shot and unceremoniously discarded his victims, he had sexually assaulted their lifeless bodies. Necrophilia is not because they can't get aroused with anything but an unresisting partner. The best way to understand necrophilia is just another ritualistic behavior that the individual engages in because killing alone was not psychosexually satisfying. He was getting enough sex, so, and as, you know, whether he penetrated them or not, just having them dead, I think, was the satisfaction of they belong to me, I control them, I can do what I want with them. Thor was convicted of four murders and one attempted murder. But might there have been more victims unaccounted for? The mysterious thing about him, there's a gap from 1977 until 79. And during that period of time, he was in Oregon. I couldn't get from him what he was doing up there, why he went there. And I remember reading some reports of murdered girls up in Oregon. It looked to me from reading those reports he very well could have been involved. And chronologically, it makes sense. How does he go 22 months without any known activity? I remember when he, uh, in the later years, when he decided uh, he wanted to be a long-haul trucker. Now, this is after he had already killed the girls in Santa Barbara. You know, now I'm thinking, oh, my God, if he was a long-haul truck driver, think how many people he could have killed across the country. I think he's responsible for a lot more than we know of. Christensen had taken the lives of at least four women, desecrated and discarded their bodies. But was murder his destiny? Was Thor Christensen born to kill? I don't think Thor Christensen was bad to the bone. I think he was mentally a wreck. 
And I think that he justified what he did because of this mental illness that he had. The best explanation for this type of offender is a biopsychosocial approach where there's a heavy emphasis on neurobiology. Bad parenting, um, psychosocial stress are never helpful, but the individual himself is the one who has to be so inclined. You can have a case where there's a family that's all disturbed and with all kinds of horrible things going on, but there's three brothers and only one behaves in the very deviant way. You always have to consider some sort of internal problem with these individuals. If he was adopted out when he was three, what would have happened, we don't know. But the way he behaved was so clearly cold-blooded, heartless, absolutely no conscience. These guys are scary guys to talk to because these guys literally snuff out a human life no more than the average person will swat a mosquito. Whatever they need, well, and if it's a car, they'll take that. If it's your wallet, they'll take that. And if it's your body, they'll take that. And they have no conscience whatsoever. Zero. I don't think Thor was born to kill because I think his early role models and home life had a lot more influence on his need to control people than any organic or neurological issue that we, that at least that we know about. In 1980, Christensen was sentenced to life imprisonment for his crimes. Six months after he goes to Folsom Prison, another prisoner stabbed him to death, shanked him from behind. And by the way, when you look like Christensen and you do the crimes that he did, you're not liked even by prisoners. There's a little bit of honor among thieves, so to speak. And every criminal has a mother, aunt, sisters, wife, they don't like Christensen's behavior, and so he, he was killed. Personally, I think it's the best thing that could have happened. He didn't need to live. His parents didn't need him to live. They didn't need to have to go visit him in prison. Now they can move on. Everybody can move on. And a very vicious human being is dead. What are you going to say? You know, he killed so many innocent people. Almost 40 years since he terrified the community of Isla Vista, Thor Christensen and his crimes are largely forgotten or unknown to the optimistic new students that populate its streets. But some will never forget. One of the things that we decided to do uh, was to hold the memory of Patty and hold her smile and her active activity and her playful spirit and she was an avid juggler, and we decided to have, uh, have a juggler's festival. People came from all over, I was amazed. It sparked something. It's been like 30 some years, and it still goes on, you know, every year. And it's a benefit for the uh, Santa Barbara Rape Crisis Center. For the friends and families of Thor Christensen's innocent young victims, their memories will never die.